Hospital authorities should encourage clinical trials and should give those who take part in them time and facilities for the work. And again, the pressures on the NHS, both in hospitals and in general practice, perhaps making uh, that even more uh, difficult. And finally, therapeutic research should be regarded as a normal clinical function and not as a remote activity for the select few. And I think this is the idea of the health service being a learning health service. And again, are there opportunities to really implement that? Um, so with that kind of introduction from uh, uh, the Hinchcliffe report, uh, I'll ask Louise Bowman from the uh, Nuffield Department of Population Health to talk about clinical trials in the NHS and, and do, how, how, uh, how did we do uh, in, in that respect? Thank you very much indeed. So uh, yes, clinical trials in the NHS, how have we uh, managed to do, based on those recommendations, Rory stole them my first few slides, although he didn't have this one, uh, which was uh, one of the recommendations in the report. Um, in relation to clinical trials, there should be no ban on the prescribing of new drugs, but until the results of clinical trials are known, doctors should only prescribe new drugs when existing drugs have failed. And then onwards, as Rory's already said, new drugs should be subjected to independent controlled clinical trial as early as possible. And yes, interestingly, hospital authorities should encourage clinical trials and should give those who take part in them time and facilities for the work. And therapeutic research should be regarded as a normal clinical function and not as a remote activity for the select few. Some very interesting ideas and, and all very laudable, I'd say. Um, so, how have we managed to do? Well, I haven't got time to go through the full 60 years of history since then, so I'm going to jump to halfway, first of all, really just as an excuse to tell you about one of my favourite clinical trials, um, which happened about 30 years ago. Um, and it was in relation to the treatment of acute myocardial infarction. A British Heart Foundation survey of physicians who treated patients who came into hospital with acute myocardial infarction asked them in 1987 what treatments did they typically use for those patients. And you can see uh, very few uh, using routinely antiplatelet treatment, aspirin, um, or fibrinolytics, a relatively new class of uh, uh, clot-busting drugs that are given intravenously. About a quarter of them using beta blockers and oral nitrates. And then a year later, uh, the results of the ISIS-2 trial uh, were announced, which really was an absolutely landmark trial in cardiovascular disease and really in the world of trials. Um, and I think it's been pretty hard to beat it since, actually. Um, it's a two-by-two two factorial study um, looking at two treatments, intravenous streptokinase, one of these clot-busting drugs, and separately looking at oral aspirin in patients who are admitted to hospital with acute myocardial infarction. The primary endpoint is vascular death, a pretty hard endpoint, uh, easy to quantify, um, and a relatively short duration of follow-up. Uh, the plot was shown for up to five weeks from that acute event. And 16,000 patients randomised into the trial in a number of countries around the world, but with the UK playing a substantial role. And if we look at the results, uh, they speak for themselves, really. Uh, the patients who got uh, neither of those uh, treatments and just had routine hospital care alone, at the end of five weeks, 13% of them were dead. For those that got the active aspirin, 11% were dead. For those that got the active streptokinase, 10% were dead. And those that were lucky enough to get both treatments, 8% were dead by five weeks. We don't need too much in the way of clever statistics to tell us that 8% dead is better than 13% dead five weeks after having a heart attack. So then, when the British Heart Foundation went back to those physicians a year later and asked them uh, what about their prescribing habits, um, it's no surprise that they've changed really very dramatically. Far and away, the majority now recommending aspirin um, and, uh, and a good number uh, using those fibrinolytic drugs as well. So this really important trial had dramatically changed practice and was going to be saving a lot of lives into the future. Why did it do such a good job? Well, it was asking an important question. Uh, it was answering uh, some questions that we really didn't know the answers to in terms of uh, the use of these drugs. And it was very successful from a trial point of view because it was incredibly simple. There was very little in the way of paperwork. This was the uh, uh, entire amount of paperwork that was needed to be done by the doctors uh, who were involved in the trial. One page uh, of data collection, really very simple. This, in fact, is the entire uh, protocol for the study, a historical artifact that I've always been rather fond of. A full 16 pages in its entirety, a whole page devoted to the steering committee on the back there. Um, and um, a double page spread in the middle 
with the poster that tells you everything that you need to know about the trial. It could go up on the wall in the AME's department, um, and that's really all that you needed. For those enthusiastic junior doctors that wanted to carry it around with them all the time, that would fit in their quaint white coat pocket. Um, and that was the lot, everything that you needed to do the trial and to do a really good job of a trial that really changed practice. And indeed, on the front of the protocol, there's more time devoted to describing the principles of the trial, which I think uh, uh, chime very nicely with the uh, Hinchliffe uh, uh, principles. So by far the most important determinant of the success of ISIS is the extent to which in those busy hospitals where the majority of acute myocardial infarction patients are actually admitted, the responsible phys physicians and nurses choose to enter their patients. Hence, the extra work must be, and is, absolutely minimal. And I think that really is a critical factor in terms of making trials successful and getting answers uh, in terms of uh, knowing how we should be prescribing for our patients. So ISIS too certainly took part in the NHS and, uh, and the NHS is a, a really uh, valuable place for research to be done. Um, not least of all, because it includes everybody in the country. Uh, rich or poor, man, woman or child can use it or any part of it. And now in our 21st century data-driven world, there are added benefits in terms of doing research in the NHS because you can find everybody. We all have a unique identifier our NHS number that's allocated to us at birth. In this instance, before baby Bowman's parents had even thought of a name for her, she had uh, her NHS number uh, securely uh, attached. Um, and that goes with you throughout all of your experiences within the NHS, from primary care, secondary care, the ambulance service, and indeed uh, prescribing habits can all be um, uh, uh, linked using that one uh, data item. And that's proving to be a really valuable resource for uh, researchers. And I'd like to just uh, show a couple of examples of what we've done in that respect. And there are a number of data sets that one can use to uh, enable clinical trials. In particular, the hospital episode statistics data, that's discharge information from hospitals up and down the country. Uh, there are other uh, data sets related to that, AME information, outpatient information, death certification, certain disease-specific registries, national audit programs, and uh, other databases such as GP practice data, and indeed prescribing data. And now the majority of these are uh, held under the uh, umbrella and curated by NHS Digital, giving us a sort of one-stop shop uh, where we can go to access relevant data that can really improve uh, the approach to clinical trials in the UK courtesy of the NHS. So I'm just going to tell you a couple of examples of trials that we've run uh, through our department in Oxford, or are currently running, um, that give uh, some illustrations of that. And uh, walking through the sort of pathway of the trial, starting off with uh, feasibility, so uh, how do we go about setting up our clinical trial sites if we need them? Uh, where do we run the trial? How do we invite patients to take part in the study? What sort of outcome data can we get? And what about longer-term follow-up? So I've got two trials as an example, and I'll just briefly tell you uh, about what we've done in those. Starting off with the uh, Orion 4 trial, this is a randomized trial that's assessing the clinical effects of Inclisiran, which is a, a, a very novel drug that lowers LDL cholesterol, and we're assessing it in people who've got established vascular disease. Tiny bit of science behind it. Inclisiran is a drug that inhibits PCSK9, that stands for a very long word, but I'll just call PCSK9, uh, which is a protein that's produced in the liver. And um, to skip over the biochemistry, essentially it's uh, very directly involved in the turnover of LDL receptors. And so by lowering PCSK9 levels, we lower LDL cholesterol. That's the same as what the thorvastatin does, that multi-billion pound selling drug. Um, and uh, the theory is that that will be uh, a very um, effective way of reducing vascular risk. Inclisiran, the drug that we're studying in Orion 4, has a particularly interesting uh, mode of action. It works uh, to interfere with RNA. If you go back to your um, school biology days, you'll remember that uh, DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA, which is then the sort of uh, coding blocks, if you like, for proteins. And so if one blocks 
that part of the pathway, those proteins simply aren't built. And so Inclithoran prevents PCSK9 being uh, built at source in the liver cell. And as a result, it has a, a long duration of action and only needs to be given by six monthly injections. So it sounds like a really interesting drug uh, in terms of preventing cardiovascular disease in high-risk individuals. In terms of the, um, this approach blocking PCSK9, we've already got a couple of agents available to us. These are monoclonal antibodies, so they uh, work in a very different way. But two drugs, Evolocumab and Alirocumab, are already licensed. Um, and they've been demonstrated in very large-scale trials, 20,000 odd participants, um, to have clinical effects. Those trials were huge undertakings, 12 or 1,300 sites, each of them, operating in about 50 countries, so absolutely uh, mammoth projects. And they only followed their patients for a bit over two years in both instances. But what they found was that those drugs did indeed reduce LDL cholesterol very nicely, and that was associated with a reduction in cardiovascular risk, which is great, except that unfortunately those drugs were not being used as widely as they possibly could because they're exceedingly expensive. They're quite expensive to make, they're monoclonal antibodies, and we heard you talk about that earlier on, um, but they were very expensive to de develop. And each of those trials cost over a billion US dollars each to run. So obviously that's not going to be a very sustainable model, and it's certainly contributing to the costs of the drugs um, when they actually come to market. So in terms of Orion 4, not only have we got a, a different uh, type of drug, it's not a, a, an antibody, it's this RNA interference drug, but we've got a different type of trial. And we've designed a study that um, should be at least a tenth of the price of those uh, previous studies. And what we're going to do is randomise 15,000 people, um, all aged over 55, all of whom have got existing cardiovascular disease, and we'll randomise them to receive either uh, inclisiran or a matching placebo. And we're going to follow them for at least five years, so more than twice as long as those other trials for a tenth of the price. The big difference is that we're only operating in two countries. The UK, which is going to uh, uh, shoulder the burden of, of most of the uh, recruitment, aiming to recruit 12,000 participants in the UK. And then a further 3,000 in the US, largely because the FDA said we had to have 3,000 uh, American patients in the study. Otherwise, we would probably have done the whole thing in the UK. So that's just two countries, not 50. Um, about 180 study sites, not 1,500. Um, to get our 15,000 participants. It's no surprise that with that comes huge efficiencies in terms of the cost of running the study, but actually it brings with it um, increases in quality too, because you have a small number of very large study sites, you have dedicated staff at those sites who are doing this really day in, day out, it's their full-time job, and so the quality of the data that are collected are better, and the reliability of the results therefore uh, um, more convincing. Uh, when it comes to using the results to make um, uh, management decisions for our patients in the future. Where does the NHS bit come in? Well, in Orion 4, uh, we um, established a new collaboration with NHS Digital, in particular to assess feasibility for the study. So in order to be eligible for the trial, you meet a very simple criteria. If you've had a previous heart attack, a stroke, or a peripheral revascularization procedure, then uh, you're likely to be eligible. And those items can be identified very simply uh, from codes that are stored in those uh, HES discharge information. So uh, we asked NHS Digital early on in the process, before we even had ethics approval for the study, we could ask NHS Digital to run a, a search for us on the databases from the NHS trusts uh, in England to identify how many people might be suitable for the study at each trust. And within a few days, uh, they could come back to us with a list of all of the trusts in England and the numbers of tens of thousands of potentially eligible participants, which was fantastically valuable because it means we can then plot those on the map and work out where to take the trial in terms of where in the country should we be setting up sites to get the most efficient uh, recruitment into the study. And we could cross-reference with uh, sites that we've already worked with in previous collaborations, actually going back to the days of ISIS, um, uh, to make sure that we're really making the most of our pool of patients in the UK. And then the next step on from that is actually inviting the participants, once we've got all the necessary approvals in place, 
And again, NHS Digital are able to help us with that. So uh, those discharge information uh, um, details from hospital trusts uh, uh, make their way to NHS Digital. And we then, with uh, appropriate permissions in place, can access those data, including getting names and addresses of the potentially eligible participants, in order to generate invitations to those people to invite them to come and take part in the study clinic, in the study time. Uh, on the invitation letter, we ask them to give us a call uh, so that we can check a few more details, make sure that their time isn't wasted. Uh, and if they do appear to be eligible, then uh, they confirm their appointment uh, and they're given a slot to attend their local uh, hospital uh, to attend a screening clinic. It's very important that you have uh, the necessary uh, permissions to do that. We're accessing patient identifiable data without consent. There's a legislation that uh, allows for that. And again, in the UK, we're really lucky to have that. It's not straightforward to, to do it, but that's right, because one shouldn't be able to access these data uh, without a clear reason to do so. But Section 251 support from the Confidentiality Advisory Group allows us to do that. We got that just over a year ago. We have to have the necessary data sharing agreements in place with NHS Digital, but since that's all been set up, we've received over 90 data sets uh, listing more than a million patient records. And in the course of this year so far, we've invited 400,000 uh, individuals to take part in the study. And we anticipate that we'll finish recruitment for Orion 4 uh, about this time next year, I should think. So a really efficient use of data uh, from the NHS, tagged with that all-important NHS number, uh, that's allowed us to uh, recruit very large numbers of participants uh, into a trial within the UK. Let's move to my next example, uh, the ASCEND trial. ASCEND stands for Study of Cardiovascular Events and Diabetes. And it was aiming to address the simple question, for people with diabetes who haven't yet had a heart attack or stroke, is low-dose aspirin beneficial? Are omega-3 fish oils beneficial? And are these treatments safe? Now, it's quite remarkable that we didn't know the answer to these questions up until a year ago. I mean, aspirin's been around for more than a century. Uh, fish oils are purported to have all sorts of health benefits and have a multi-billion pound market, um, really based on very little evidence. So how come we didn't know the answers to these questions? And for sure, uh, going back to the Hinchliffe report, that is one of the key issues. The main difficulty facing the practitioner is the dearth of impartial information on new and I would argue, and old drugs, in convenient and readily accessible form. And the provision of adequate information is indeed a key to good prescribing. And there's no doubt that's directly relevant to the 425 million people in the world with diabetes who are very interested in the answers to those questions, uh, as were their doctors. And up until this time last year, we, we didn't know if we should be treating people with diabetes routinely with aspirin, a drug that had been around for more than a century. And why didn't we know that? Well, again, it comes down to cost. In order to run the sort of trial um, on the sort of scale that's needed to reliably answer those questions, um, typically uh, studies are going to be very expensive. We've already seen the, the billion dollar price tag uh, on those antibody studies. But even uh, aspirin and fish oils, um, one needs to have a big study and it's hard to do. And of course, there's not much in the way of pharmaceutical funding available uh, for these agents. So we had to think uh, quite laterally. We had to come up with a really uh, highly cost-effective, streamlined approach to running this trial. Again, going back to the ISIS principles, keep things really very, very simple. And we adopted for a, ma a male-based trial design. So we got rid of the expensive part of the, uh, uh, the study, the clinics and the um, uh, uh, study nurses, knowing that our UK participants would have ready access to a post box uh, on a nearby street corner. And we could run the entire study uh, by mail. We developed questionnaires. Um, this was the screening questionnaire, uh, which patients receive uh, with an information leaflet uh, in the post. This is a sort of A3 folded uh, sheet. So the, the bit on the right is the invitation letter. The bit on the left is the back page, which is the consent form. And then on the inside, we have a page which is just checking uh, contact details and then some very simple eligibility questions, checking if they've got diabetes, asking if they've previously had a heart attack or angina, participants um, completing the forms themselves, ticking the check boxes, and then returning them to us where we use optical character recognition scanning to interpret these forms. I should say in ASCEND, patients were also identified using electronic uh, data, not in this instance held centrally by NHS Digital, but getting information from 
uh, hospital-based databases or indeed uh, regional retinopathy screening databases to identify uh, people with diabetes who might be suitable for the trial. We had to come up with a way of delivering the study treatments to the, to the participants in the post and uh, worked with a packaging company to find boxes that would fit through UK letter boxes. Um, and because there was aspirin there, they had to have a special uh, child-proofing system on them, uh, sort of peel back the, the paper, preventing most adults from getting into them, but as long as you had a child nearby, you could do it. Um, and, um, and by using this system, we were able to um, operate a, a study that really went the length and breadth of the country. It got to places where other trials couldn't reach um, and was really very successful in terms of uh, recruiting what was one of the largest ever trials in, in diabetes of its time. So 15,500 patients in the UK alone, uh, all aged over 40 with diabetes, but no previous cardiovascular disease. Randomised again in a factorial design, looking at omega-3 fatty acid supplements at a low dose, one gram dose, compared with placebo, and then separately uh, aspirin 100 milligrams uh, compared with placebo, and followed them for an average of just under seven and a half years, so quite a substantial undertaking <coughs> in terms of long-term follow-up. And even though there weren't study clinics to attend, we managed to uh, maintain really quite respectable adherence to the study treatments, over two-thirds taking the aspirin component on average and a little more taking the fish oils, which is a, a testament to a lot of work uh, undertaken at the coordinating centre. And uh, the key to getting reliable uh, results in a clinical trial are firstly making sure your trial is big enough and well designed uh, to have sufficient statistical power, but then to make sure that your participants uh, continue with the intervention and that you get the follow-up information. And again, doing all of that entirely by mail uh, was not straightforward. We sent participants questionnaires every six months, and if they uh, weren't able to or didn't complete the questionnaires, uh, we got in touch with their GP to get the information <coughs> instead. And because it was all in the UK, we could link to those central registries, so we had uh, death notifications and cancer registry information to supplement uh, the follow-up information. And we could also link to the hospital episode statistics uh, records uh, for those where we didn't have complete uh, data. And at, by the end of the study, uh, our follow-up was, uh, again, I extremely res respectable, 99% complete. Although, it's worth noting that if we hadn't have had linkage to the HES record, there probably would have been about 6% of the child co cohort for whom this, uh, information would have been missing. In terms of the study results, this shows the, um, uh, the primary endpoint for uh, the omega-3 fatty acid supplements. And you can see uh, that we did not demonstrate any clear benefit uh, in terms of the effect on serious vascular events uh, with the omega-3 fatty acid supplements. Again, we're stressing it's a low-dose supplement in this instance. In terms of the aspirin, uh, we did uh, observe a, a benefit. 658 participants in the active group compared with 743 in the placebo group uh, experiencing serious vascular events, which was a 12% proportional reduction uh, in that endpoint over the seven and a half years of follow-up. But that was largely balanced by uh, an adverse effect in terms of uh, a hazard when it came to major bleeding. Um, a, a 314 major bleeds in the aspirin group and 245 in the placebo group. And when one uh, weighs up the benefits and the, the hazards, actually in this group, it seems that there isn't a justification for routinely recommending aspirin um, for people with diabetes who haven't previously had uh, a vascular uh, event. Uh, we announced those results. Myself and Jane Armitage uh, gave uh, hotline presentations at the European Society of Cardiology Congress last year um, and had uh, a simultaneous, uh, two, simultaneously two publications in the New England Journal of Medicine. And there was an awful lot of press interest uh, in the stories. These were agents, as I say, that uh, have been around for a very long time, and the implications were for many millions of people around the world. Um, so there was a lot of interest in it, and indeed the results have already informed national and international guidelines for patients with diabetes and for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. We've still got a lot to do. We're looking at um, arrhythmia events and presented some more data on that at this year's European Society of Cardiology meeting uh, and are uh, uh, preparing a paper on that. We're looking at dementia outcomes. And then with the linkage to the HES data, uh, we're exploring uh, bleeding outcomes and, and the outpatient data too. 
And of course, with a uh, captive trial cohort of 15 and a half thousand people with diabetes, there's a lot of interest in uh, effects on the eye. Uh, so we're um, managing to link to retinopathy screening data. And along the way, there's been uh, increasing interest on the effects of aspirin and cancer. And we're very, very well placed, again, with cancer registry linkage within the NHS uh, to look at longer term effects of aspirin uh, on cancer outcomes in this trial. So a whistle-stop tour, I hope showing you just some of the options available to us and some of what we have managed to achieve in terms of uh, using the NHS to help us uh, run low-cost and yet high-quality trials that most definitely have the potential to, to inform practice. Um, some of these items have been uh, uh, cited at, at quite high levels, so the Orion 4 feasibility and invitation process uh, uses a case study in the NHS digital annual report and indeed, uh, the UK government's uh, life science industrial strategy also uh, citing the line for mm. its novel methods. We've still got quite a lot to do, though. Um, we haven't managed to um, uh, overcome all of the hurdles, not least of all some of the regulatory ones. And Martin's going to be talking a little bit about that. Uh, the governance issues remain. It's important that the right governance structure is in place, although I think it's sometimes a little hard to navigate, and there's work being done to improve that along with the availability of these data sets for researchers and work to understand some of the other outcomes uh, better. We're very fortunate in cardiovascular disease that the cardiovascular outcomes are, I think, very well understood, perhaps a little less so in some other clinical fields, but huge potential from those electronic data sets. And indeed, um, securing additional data sets if primary care data could make its way to NHS Digital, that really would have, uh, bring huge opportunity for this in terms of uh, um, improving our options for clinical trials, as would uh, speeding up the data flow uh, of these data sets. But I think we have come a long way. I think we've um, uh, done a good job of informing prescribing habits uh, where the trials have been done, but what we've missed out on, I think, is an awful lot more trials, um, because they are very hard to do, and they're becoming increasingly costly. And I think that's something that Martin is going to turn to in terms of uh, how we could improve matters for the future and try to um, uh, uh, fulfill those expectations of the Hinchers report. Thank you very much. We have uh, one or two minutes if there are questions. Of, uh, there's a question just up there. So we do have uh, somewhat limited data on the use of other drugs uh, during the course of the, the study. Um, and uh, we have looked at the effects in the context of, of other drugs. It, it starts to get rather tricky because the numbers start to get small in terms of being able to say anything robust about it. Um, so it, it's hard to draw any clear conclusions, but it's something that would be certainly of, of, of great value because the increase in those gastrointestinal drugs over the course of time uh, it's, it's quite yeah. Thanks, Louise. Lovely talk. I, I'm, I'm sorry if I missed it, but I wonder if what you're doing about monitoring adverse events in Orion 4, and I wonder if you're concerned about the possibility of serious, difficult adverse reactions occurring, given that this drug has such a very, very long duration of action. So, um, in terms of the uh, follow up of Orion 4, it's following a, a, a fairly standard clinic-based model. So patients attend uh, study clinics and uh, provide information about serious adverse events uh, in person. Um, we will also be linking to the uh, HES record to get the sort of full electronic data, but we get real-time uh, information from patients or their doctors uh, if they uh, are concerned about anything like that. The long-term effect of it is interesting, isn't it? I mean, the actual drug itself has a relatively short half-life, 24 hours, if that, um, but its impact on the RNA is rather longer. So yes, one of the reasons why we want to be certain that we're doing long enough follow-up in the trial, designed to have a minimum of at least five years of follow-up, uh, so we can really feel confident about safety aspects of it. Uh, a frustration with those monoclonal antibody trials that uh, the companies perhaps wanted a 
a, a quick bang for the buck and um, stopped after you know, the two years. Yeah, I was going to say, I think one of the, one of the early PCS K9 inhibitors that was a monoclonal was uh, failed because of that, and that mm. may be quite important. Yes. Thanks very much, Louise. So I think you, what, what Louise has introduced is um, you really how the NHS is set up to facilitate the evaluation of treatment, probably in a way that no other country is. Um, I mean, very large scale, uh, a very heterogeneous population, uh, and then these health record systems. So one could say, well, you know, Scandinavia has health record systems, but they don't have the scale or the heterogeneity. And I think you, what, what we're now seeing is a, uh, a move within the higher echelons of NHS to work with people like NHS Digital to actually uh, take what was in the NHS report and try to really make that the way in which um, uh, treatments are evaluated, um, not only for patients in the NHS, but in pa for patients all around the world. So um, uh, I we got a kind of taster of what could be uh, done. Randomized trials were invented in, in clinical medicine in the UK in 1950 with the streptomycin trial. And perhaps now we'll hear about the reinvention of randomized trials uh, from Martin Landra. Martin. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inv inviting me to talk. Um, I was given the, the title, uh, Clinical Trials in the NHS, How Can We Do More? Uh, and I want to cover uh, some of the opportunities we have. But I want to start by saying that uh, despite the uh, uh, extraordinary achievements of clinical trials over the last uh, uh, many decades, actually we're at something of a turning point, at something of a crisis. We're at a crisis because of the rising cost and complexity of clinical trials. Louise highlighted that with two particular examples. But the consequence is getting, we're getting fewer, smaller, shorter, and less informative clinical trials. The consequence of that is actually that uh, amongst the drug development industry, what we're seeing is that uh, they are having to make decisions really quite early in the drug development uh, uh, timeline because they have to consider, is, it, is this particular molecular entity really worth a billion dollar bet? And if you look ahead and you say, I can de continue developing this for another few years, but at that point I'm going to have to put a billion dollars on the table, you will naturally kill off quite a lot of potentially promising drugs really quite early. And that's before we get into the issue about the very large numbers of therapies that are used without any evidence base behind them at all, at least certainly not randomized trial evidence. The second issue is about disillusionment amongst the clinical investigator community. And I think we're increasingly seeing that with the burden of regulation and additional complexities and the complications of actually working in the NHS, as some of us do, that actually uh, the, uh, the additional challenges of doing clinical trials are just too much. There's a distortion of the drug development priorities. I'll show you a little example of that, and we saw a little bit from uh, some of the earlier presentations. And a lot of this is really being driven by an over-interpretation of unfit regulatory guidelines, which have really suffocated uh, innovation uh, and made it hard to improve the quality and efficiency of trials. So this is uh, my version, or our version, actually it's quite meanwhile from the medicines company's version of, this, of the data we saw earlier uh, on um, from the Health Foundation. And this is US data looking at the top 10 selling drugs in the US in 2000 and 2015. And you can see that the revenue has gone up two and a half fold from $34 billion to $84 billion in that time. We saw that earlier on. But what you can also see is that potential patients within the US who could be treated by those uh, treatments has gone down from 413 million to 54 million, a seven and a half fold decrease. So if you like, this is a rather crude uh, calculation, I'm not an economist, uh, I'm scarcely a mathematician, uh, it's a 19 fold increase in the cost per patient. 
when you look at those top 10 drugs, it looks very similar to those data we saw from the NHS earlier on, that there's a shift from Lipitor, atorvastatin, and other uh, treatments for common diseases, degenerative diseases, the sort of diseases of middle and late age, uh, through to drugs that are very expensive for rare diseases and cancer. So if that's what's happening to the drug development industry, who's, uh, who's gaining and what are the consequences? Well, there's one sector that is gaining. This is the so-called uh, contract research organization market, or the CRO industry, which in the early 1990s pretty much didn't exist. It's gone from a couple of billion uh, uh, dollars uh, per year in the early 1990s, when good clinical practice regulations were introduced, to 35 billion uh, uh, and, and rising over the last few years. Every two years, uh, sorry, every five years, the revenue doubles. What's interesting, and not on this slide, this is the commercial sector. What's interesting is actually if one looks at the non-commercial sector of clinical trials units uh, that are effectively acting as CROs, the so-called academic research organizations, one sees a similar pattern of doubling revenue every five years. It's at a lower level, but it's still doubling. And so the future is really how can we take uh, advantage of the technological advances in healthcare, in engineering, in communications, all the things in our daily lives to facilitate randomized assessments of treatment efficacy and safety. And I'm gonna to touch on two pieces of this, and there's more to it, but I'm gonna pick out two particular pieces. The first is the efficient uh, the need for efficient NHS data services, and the second I'll come to later is this challenge about regulation. So we've heard from Louise uh, that actually what we have in the NHS is an extraordinary uh, wealth of data. That wealth of data could drive efficiency with larger, more real world, whatever that means, imagine trials happen in a surreal world, I don't think that's the case. More real world trials, it, the data are comprehensive, they give you national reach, they minimize the loss to follow up, the uh, they extend the breadth of outcomes that you can assess, and they're durable, so we can look at not only outcomes over two years or five years, but over 10 years or 20 years and beyond. But there are big challenges. One's around accessibility, it's quite hard to get hold of the data. One, one is, hard, is uh, a question about accuracy, not all the data are accurate, not all the data are present. Uh, and one is around confidence. And not all audiences or regulators are completely convinced by the story. To sort of uh, distort a, uh, the ancient mariner's view of this, there's really data, data everywhere, but not a drop to drink. So what I want to think about is what are the opportunities? Now, Louise showed a graph that, or a map that looks somewhat like the one on the right, which is where are patients with cardiovascular disease? This is a very similar analysis prepared by NHS Digital, and that returns something like one and a half million patients with cardiovascular disease who are in a particular age range and particular criteria for a trial. But is this only suitable for large-scale studies of really common diseases? Cardiovascular disease is old hat, it's really easy, there's lots of it. Of course, a big data approach will work. Well, actually, you can use the same approach and identify 379,000 people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, 185,000 people with ulcerative colitis, or even 43,000 people with ankylosing spondylitis. So actually there are large numbers of people and data will lead you to them. It won't necessarily provide with all the details that you need, but you'll be able to locate where you would like to do your research. And I've, to come to this point about establishing a system, uh, Louise touched on the life sciences uh, industry, sec industry sector uh, deal last year with which Orion 4 was a sort of exemplar. But the other feature in there was, act was that NHS Digital and Health Data Research UK, which I lead the trials work for, will lead the uh, work on the creation of data services to support a 21st century clinical trials platform. And during the last few months, in fact, it's then been announced that the uh, so-called NHS Digitrial uh, is a new uh, data hub focusing exactly on this. We have the richness of the data and the NHS world and NHS digital stage off. We have the experience in the UK of running clinical trials, but there needs to be some sort of interface between the two so that the data presented in a timely, usable and understandable uh, format specifically for the clinical trials community. 
the areas we're going to tackle around feasibility, that's, that's where, where should I locate my centres, identification and recruitment, uh, Louise gave the example from both the ASCEND uh, study and the Orion 4 study of how we can turn those uh, data into names and those names into people attending, but also how do we maintain communications with the patients and their doctors throughout the, the journey, and then finally how can we track outcomes, safety outcomes, efficacy outcomes in the short, medium and long term. And of course, this has been done before. This is Scottish, uh, a Scottish example. This is the Roscup study. The original trial was about five years long and showed that taking pravastatin reduced the risk of cardiovascular events. Actually, you could reproduce exactly the same results if you switch on to the Scottish equivalent of HES data and then roll forwards for the best part of 20 years. And you can see continuing benefits over a long period of time. And when we think about statins, we don't expect people to take statins for five years. We expect people to take them for 10 years, 20 years and more. What it also shows us is that new benefits emerge over time. So this is on uh, the effects on heart failure. So during the course of the trial, the first five years or so on the left-hand side, there was no impact of pravastatin on heart failure. Heart failure is a late consequence of having uh, 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 atherosclerosis in your coronary arteries or having a myocardial infarction. But you do see benefits later on. And both of those pictures have, have important implications for um, uh, for health economics for, and for patients. And of course, as we go forward with data, then there's the richness of mobile technology uh, that will also allow us uh, to um, uh, extend and to capture information on the sorts of things that are not captured in records, symptoms, function, activity, and so on. We can use the data even to monitor the performance. We no longer need to go to sites check one piece of paper versus the next piece of paper to say, as if one was true and the other was not. We no need to longer need to do the sort of source data verification because we can use the data to actually uh, identify ab abnormal performance. In this plot, each dot represents a hospital. There's actually about 300 hospitals, I think, in this particular plot. Uh, up the y-axis, is it's almost like a GWAS plot. It's the uh, p-value, and you can see those top right-hand uh, uh, sites, which are circled, uh, a P times 10 to, to the minus 5. There's something extraordinarily odd about those sites. Now, if you're a pharma company, you go to every one of these sites equally frequently and very frequently and check every, every piece of data that this number matches that number. You wouldn't check whether the patients were actually consented. You wouldn't necessarily check how the data got written down on the piece of paper. You distribute, you spread your resource across all of those pieces and focus on the wrong thing. This can allow us to say those top three or four sites are odd. They are exceptional, they may be exceptionally good, but that seems unlikely, uh, and those are the places to concentrate one's efforts. So that's the sort of power that the data can give us and gives us a flavor of those options. The second piece is what about the regulation? Now, the regulations over the last 25 and uh, years or so, perhaps a little longer, have really been driven by so-called uh, good clinical practice. It's a terrible name. It's nothing to do with good or clinical or practice, but that's what it's called. And it's, co it's concocted by an organization called the ICH, uh, which has changed its name at least once, but is, is essentially the International Conference on Harmonization. It's a club of uh, regulators and industry. It was set up originally when pharma turned around to uh, the FDA, the EMA, and actually the Japanese PMDA and said, look, we keep doing these trials, and every time we bring a result to you, you say, oh, you shouldn't have done it like that, you should have done it like this. And could you just get your act together, come up with something consistent, you don't really mind what it is, come up with something consistent so at least we know what the, what the exam question is, and we can keep coming back and, and, and get some efficiency. It's a reasonable request, but by goodness, be careful what you ask for, as I'll come to. It claimed it was an international and scientific quality standard, that it was, as I say, to produce some sort of unif unified or harmonized standard. And unfortunately also said, and it may also be applied to other clinical investigations. This was from a group of people who actually had never done any clinical trials or necessarily any other investigations. So the problems with the ICH GCP, it's not based on the scientific principles of randomized controlled trial. It's actually been applied way more widely than it was ever intended. So for example, the EU uh, clinical trials regulation refers back to ICHGCP. So this thing that was not law and is guidelines is now referred to in a, in a law that affects the whole of Europe and affects the whole of Europe for any trials of any drugs 
not just trials of uh, um, drugs heading for new registration. The Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust both require uh, compliance with uh, ICHDCP if you get money from them to do a clinical trial. So way outside its original uh, intention. It's actually not working well for industry, the people it was designed for. It's not working for non-commercial trials. And, I, and in particular, it really is not uh, obsolete in the sense that it's uh, suited, if at all, for a world in which carbon copy was state of the art and the filing cabinet was a thing that sat in the corner and had drawers in it. And really, these days, if you think about where your data are and you think about what, how, how data is stored and what a file is, these concepts or physical these physical construction concepts just don't fit, and yet that's what the rules are. And many people spend a lot of time, including, frankly, us, taking the approaches that Louise has done and trying to work out how we can justify this in the context of a set of rules which were written for, for uh, a different technology. And finally, it has no input from patients, academic trialists, or the non-commercial sector. It is simply a club between regulators and industry. Well, Jeff Aronson kindly mentioned the issues of safety, and I thought that would be a good example to pick up. And to just highlight one area where GCP really is not fit for purpose. So these are the definitions. So first of all, it comes out with a definition of serious adverse events. Any untoward medical occurrence that at any dose results in death is life-threatening, requires inpatient hospitalization and a few, and a few other things behind, besides. Well, one trouble is that actually serious is not the same as severe. It is to the patient, it is to most doctors, it is to the man in the pub or the lady behind in the pub, uh, but it is not the same thing. So it causes confusion instantly. The second definition I want to push out is an adverse reaction, a drug reaction, a causal relationship between a medicinal product and an adverse event, something bad happening, is at least a reasonable probability, i.e. the relationship cannot be ruled out. Now, is at least a reasonable probability and cannot be ruled out are essentially at opposite ends of the, of the uh, probability spectrum. And i.e., for those who have forgotten their Latin, is id est, I, that is, equals. So the, this, this confusion uh, is, is written right in the regulations. Now, when you do, um, you think about reactions and is a reasonable probability, then you think that actually a doctor who is giving a patient a treatment and something happens to them might be in a good position to uh, determine whether that... Um, uh, headache or whatever it might be, that adverse effect was caused by the treatment that the patient's just got. And there's lots of standard tests we use in clinical practice. You, know, you take it away, you give it back again, does the headache recur? Uh, um, does it occur more at higher doses and so on and so forth? Uh, there's lots of tests that we can use and approaches we can use. It actually turns out doctors are remarkably poor at understanding causality. So here are the regulatory reports from three trials that we did, uh, big trials, uh, looking at these are all adverse events that are occurred that are serious and occurred with a reasonable probability. In other words, the doctor thought they were due to the drug. And you can see there's as many on the active treatment as there are on the placebo treatment. So they were confident that these 36 events here were caused by the drug, but they didn't know it was placebo. So actually, this this whole concept of assessing causality and the uh, spurious paperwork that flies out the end of this, and the punishments that are associated with not completing that paperwork are a real distortion of effort. By comparison, here's a, here's a, a study uh, of niacin, a, uh, um, a vitamin treatment, at, but at high doses. At, at, uh, you can see that actually, it, when one just simply com collects the data, analyzes by the intention to treat principle, actually you can see adverse effects on bleeding and infection, which had never been seen uh, in uh, 50 years of using that treatment, and in fact, in those trials, were not reported one single time as uh, Suzar. No doctor ever thought any one of those was ever related to the treatment. So I'm going to, uh, if I may, skip ahead because I want to uh, make sure we leave uh, enough time for, for discussion. This issue about shifting um, uh, the position around good clinical practice uh, there have been discussions about this for the last 15 or 20 years. In fact, probably since just before GCP really became, uh, uh, um, uh, came in um, uh, in the mid-90s. 
But there are some evidence that one, with collaboration, one can actually make progress. So the FDA uh, uh, set up what they call the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, which has a very broad stakeholder uh, group. So it has industry in, it has regulators, it has um, uh, funders, it has clinicians, it has uh, academic trialists, it even has CROs. It has a large number of patient advocates as part of that group. And they, over that time, have managed to produce some shifts into in uh, the way that uh, clinical trials are regulated. So they came up with a few early recommendations which sort of sound obvious and are sort of in ICHDCP but have never really probed all the way through. The first is clinical trials should incorporate quality in their scientific and operational design for, uh, conduct and analysis. In other words, think at the beginning what's important in this trial and make sure you focus on that piece. It sounds sort of basic but that's not the way that clinical trials uh, are regulated in many instances. And if you want to know what quality is, quality in, in the context of clinical trials is defined as the absence of uh, uh, a, uh, an issue or an error that might matter. It might matter either to the patients that are in the trial, their safety, for example, or to the credibility of the results, and the results, of course, influence the care of future patients. So either way, it comes back to patients. That, uh, uh, those principles of so-called quality by design have actually filtered from uh, one uh, uh, you know, set of meetings in Washington over the last uh, uh, five or ten years, have actually filtered their way through the regulations, through the US Code of Federal Regulations, the EU Clinical Trials Directive, various regulatory guidelines, in through Transcelerate, which is the industry club of um, uh, how, how do we get trials done given that we can't shift the regulations, and in, even back into the ICH GCP uh, regulation, where they put the sponsor should implement a system to manage quality throughout the design, conduct, recording, evaluation, reporting and archiving of clinical trials. The, the methods should be proportionate to the risks uh, and the importance of the information collected. This is something that they added in new, but they failed to take any of the old stuff away. So every time, and this is a pattern of regulation, is people will always add more. Rob Califf, who was um, commissioner of the FDA for a while, had a beautiful analogy of the Christmas tree. And every year the Christmas tree comes out and you add decorations to it. And next year, you, nobody wants to take Granny's uh, particular favorite knitted stocking off there. Uh, and nobody wants to, to take that fairy off there. And you add more and more tinsel. So you, in, in the end, you get something uh, grotesque. It doesn't look like a Christmas tree. And eventually it just falls over. So. We, had, we started about, uh, uh, I suppose, about eight years ago, really, a sort of public campaign, and particularly over the last uh, four or five years, the More Trials ca campaign. And this was really driven by this need to not just keep adding, but could we start again? And I think in this data-rich world, it's sometimes worth uh, thinking to ourselves, let's assume now that we have data, let's assume we have communications technology. Let's start with the modern world that we, all, we are all in. Let's go to the health service and the modern health service that we're all in. Let's hope those two match. And then let's say, and if randomization was invented today, what would it look like? And what would the rules look like? Let's not try to take uh, something that was invented, uh, as in uh, these uh, standards, invented in the mid-80s and early 90s, and try and, and try and contort today's behavior to what we did then, none of you would be watching your, your favorite movie on YouTube. None of you would have smartphones, any of that, if that's the way we always, uh, always apply uh, um, in, uh, to innovation. So ICH made this lobby about, uh, sorry, uh, the More Trials campaign made a lobby uh, to ICH. And to their credit, uh, and I will give them some credit, uh, they, to their credit, they actually did listen and in reflection, and they quoted that, uh, our letter uh, as a consequence, that they would modernize their guidelines. And there are two particular guidelines. The E8 guideline, one thing you should know about the ICH is it's full of E numbers. We all know E numbers are bad. The ICH uh, should modernize its E8, E8 guidance, which is general considerations for clinical studies, and should then, in due course, and it turns out over the next two or three years, renovate, whatever that means, its E6 guidance, which is the GCP guidance, which everybody quotes. 
And one of the difficulties with GCP is everybody says GCP, and there are actually about 16 versions of it, and they're all slightly different, and they all really sort of relate to other documents. So one, uh, this year they have uh, modernized their E8 guidance. Uh, in the end of October, I think it was Halloween. Uh, yes, it was Halloween. Uh, so uh, Brexit didn't happen, but this, uh, they had a public consultation in Washington uh, on their renovations to, or modernization of E8 guidance. They had taken that essence of quality by design, get it right before you start, focus on the things that are critical, and had therefore produced a cross-reference between the things that they thought were critical and the relevant aspects of each of the guidelines. And it looks like this. So when you're designing your trial, let's assume that each row, well, each row is something that is supposedly critical to quality, and by and large, that's right, eligibility criteria, randomization, blinding and masking, and so on and so forth. Each column is one of their myriad e-guidelines. Some are about safety, some are about uh, statistical uh, design, some are about drug supply, some are about uh, the practice on the drought. There's a whole host of them. And you can see that just to, do, uh, to understand eligibility, in theory, you're supposed to read and take account of nine different guidelines. And somewhere in each of those nine different guidelines is something that's relevant to you as you think about eligibility. This is a nonsense. This is, the, the guidance itself is far from quality by design. And if you're worried about that list, it gets worse on the second page uh, when we go up to about 11 or 12 guidelines when we start thinking about safety reporting. So this is an unworkable system. It's unduly complex. And when it's complex, what it drives is either people uh, give up completely or uh, they get it wrong or a new profession of GCPologists emerges, and every organization, including our own, has them, uh, that actually now over-interprets, over-inspects, over-applies these guidelines. So to finish, what we have now established, and I have just uh, taken up a secondment, uh, a part-time secondment at the Wellcome Trust to lead this, is a new joint initiative for good clinical uh, uh, practice and clinical research. And the vision is actually we should just start again. Just as I said, we've got the state of the world. We have, we have randomization. Let's start again. So we need rational guidance that's proportionate to the risks. Not all trials actually have risks. We actually need to space them on the fundamental scientific and ethical principles. We, what, what would inf influence the well-being of the trial participants and the reliability of the results which would influence future patients? They need to be clear. They need to be concise. They need to be consistent and recognize, as I say, the risks associated with usual care, which is, of course, the alternative. And usual care is not without risks. In fact, they're usually unknown risks because they were never evaluated. And they need to be co-developed through a sort of open, open approach. So let's not just have a club of regulators in industry. Let's actually broaden that out so that there's commercial and academic trialists, there's clinicians, there's patients, there's public, there's funders, and so on. And let's think forward. Let's challenge ourselves. Let's not try and regulate for the past, but regulate for the future. And that's a much tougher ask. Let's imagine what the world could look like in five years, 10 years, and 20 years. And that will help us to think about when we've got principles rather than detail. And finally, they need to be broadly applicable, widely adopted, and durable. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Maybe I could uh, ask uh, Martin and, and Louise to come up here um, for a discussion for the next 15 minutes or so. And um, just also to mention that uh, Tom Denwood from NHS Digital is here, uh, and Tom, along with Sarah Wilkinson, the CEO of NHS Digital, have really been driving uh, this initiative uh, within the NHS about how to uh, make data accessible and, and how to um, ensure that those data can be used to help us uh, evaluate treatment, both efficacy and, and safety. So Tom is over there, people want to ask questions of him as well. Um, question right up at the back there on the right, thank you. Thanks, um, and thank you for the really informative talks, I really enjoyed those. Um, my name is Ellen Rule. I have a number of different roles, including being a director in the NHS, being a health economist, and having sat on um, nice decision groups for about 10 years. 
Um, I really, um, one thing you said really chimed with me, um, which is how the evidence has changed over the last kind of 10 years that we've seen, um, certainly coming through NICE in terms of the reducing quality um, of trials, the amount of time of evidence we've got um, to look at and the size of them, etc. I therefore um, wondered what your thoughts were on the accelerated access review um, that the government's conducted um, and where that sort of would take us next, particularly in terms of applying some of those products into the NHS, which we are obviously encouraged to do. Um, yes, yeah, so that was my first question. And I had a separate question about your thoughts as well on the increasing um, use of overseas sites for trials, particularly in developing countries, and some of the challenges that brings as well. What I, what I would say is that um, the, one of the things we're, one sees is that, uh, and one sees this in the US as well, is an unintended consequence of encouraging development uh, for, of drugs for particularly rare diseases uh, is that um, uh, people now create rare diseases. And so when it's, it's uh, not uncommon uh, to see what one might consider to be a broad disease. Take, take kidney disease progression as an example. Actually, from the biology, what, uh, lead, given that you ha a patient might have kidney impairment, what leads to it getting worse is actually pretty common across the different causes. But the uh, accelerated pathways and the preferential regulatory approaches might lead one to say, well, I'm going to study one specific subgroup of all that uh, because I on the basis of, frankly, very little knowledge at that stage, think it's going to be uh, you know, particularly uh, valuable. It's going to get, I'm going to get a particularly big effect. That's one. And the second is I'm going to get a particularly kind review. And I think we do. there is a recognition more broadly that actually some of those uh, uh, <coughs> distortion are of the, of the approach. So some of what we're seeing in rare disease, my, my shift to, uh, from common disease to rare disease is driven by that. But I should say... You know, all disease is important, and any patient who's got any disease clearly is seeking a therapy. I'm not, I'm not arguing that in any way, but if one looks at the big picture, one's seeing this. Uh, your second question was, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so I have two different things here. I think, first of all, uh, uh, well, first of all, with debating a report which was based in the NHS, so I focus very much on the UK. Um, uh, but um, the, play, the, 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 the uh, location of your trial really need, needs to be driven by the science rather than driven uh, by the eco economics. What actually happens in, in uh, many clinical trials, so for example, the PCSK9 antibody trials that Louise was showing with 50-odd countries, is that the company will say, well, we'll get, we need to get to 20% of the patients in the US because the FDA tell us. We need a few hundred patients in Japan because the PMDA tell us. And the rest is basically out and up for grabs. And each of their subsidiaries says, yes, you know, I think I can do 10, and I think I can do 100. And there's some sort of debating going on. It's an incredibly inefficient way of, do of doing research. Uh, whereas, actually, the, more, the, the fewer the countries, the fewer the sites, the larger the sites, the better. Uh, whether a trial is uh, located in the UK or located in Eastern Europe or uh, Southern Africa should be driven by the science, the medical condition and so on. The same principles apply. Uh, reduce, the, reduce the footprint uh, and maximise the quality. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, there's one back there. Got a mic. Me, I had a, a question about um, external validity. So you just mentioned the sites of the trial should be driven by the science. Um, but inevitably, there's something about trial sites, for example, enthusiastic uh, doctors or you know a particular type of hospital. Or the eligibility criteria for ethical reasons means you don't get to very sick patients, whereby your trials may be internally valid, but it might not necessarily translate exactly into the wider NHS, even if it was trialled within the NHS. I mean, one possibility, which I don't think is done very much, is um, 
so that's one set of issues. But then you can, using NHS digital data, sort of ex post look at what happened when you did roll out these things across the country. And certainly with some large interventions, that's possible. But I certainly have tried to do that in the past, and there's been a bit of hostility towards that, partly because obviously if you run the clinical trial and you've shown a positive effect, showing that in a wider population it doesn't have quite the same effect, even if that's for very valid reasons, it doesn't necessarily tend to go down very well. So what can we do more to understand the link between these clinical trials and then what actually happens in the wider NHS? Well, the first thing is that the uh, randomized clinical trial uh, gives you a very good estimate of the proportional uh, um, reductions in the risk of whatever it is that you're trying to prevent. Um, and that uh, uh, proportional reduction is an unbiased estimate and is the most reliable estimate you've got. The question then comes, are the patients who are outside your trial different to the ones inside? Now, they can really only be different in two ways. One is that they're at different levels of risk of getting the thing you're trying to prevent. So in the PCSK9, they, they're at higher risk of cardiovascular disease, in which case apply the proportional reduction from in the trial to whatever the level of risk is in an external environment. The second is they could be different in terms of their risk of getting uh, some adverse effects. So perhaps the send and the bleeding is a good example where uh, the risk of bleeding could be substantially higher if you, took, if you took a very general approach and said, we'll give aspirin to everybody, including all those people who've just had a GI bleed. Um, so I think, one, first of all, one needs to think carefully about what one's trying to, uh, where one's taking, what question one's asking. But secondly, the most robust est estimate comes from the randomization. The question about generalizability is, is it very related to the one about sort of precision medicine and accelerated access in some ways. It's the fact that uh, many trials, by design, try to um, find the perfect population in whom their treatment is going to work wonderfully well at a point at which they don't know whether it works at all, let alone wonderfully well. Uh, and actually, the, the, the reason for that is cost uh, uh, of doing the trial. If we bring costs down by you know, an order of magnitude or, or more, as Louise is suggesting, then actually this issue about how large can my, does my trial need to be no longer becomes much of an issue. And if we could get the trials to be larger, we can have broader eligibility criteria and therefore have results that are not the same as, if, as, as, uh, as all comers, but are quite close to it. There's a broader question, though, there, I think, which is around um, how the complexity and cost of randomized trials uh, is driving people to alternatives to randomized trials, so-called real-world evidence observational studies. And the belief that I think is inherent in the question that observational data can actually provide reliable information about both the efficacy and safety of treatments that could either replace or, or um, even complement uh, usefully uh, randomized evidence. I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Yeah, the term real world is always um, uh, alarming to a trialist, and I think uh, increasingly one feels threatened that our trials aren't happening in the real world. As Martin said, they definitely are, and all those tens of thousands of patients most definitely are. But with the uh, increasing availability of very uh, detailed and huge uh, data sets, the lure of um, uh, exploring those in an observational way uh, is very, very great, but they are still observational, and it doesn't matter how uh, uh, broad or uh, deep your data set is or how beautifully curated it is, um, it will still be uh, at risk of the inherent confounding that uh, you can't overcome without randomization. And it, it seems to be a um, uh, very much a... Um, uh, a popular topic at the moment, uh, aiming to overcome the limitations of randomized trials by resorting to uh, what are observational data instead. If alternatively we can improve the practice of randomized trials, if we can make them far simpler to do, improve the uh, regulations surrounding it, use some of the, uh, the techniques that I've described and uh, increasing resources of data to actually make trials far, far more efficient, then it 
doesn't seem like the right solution to use the wrong methodology to answer the question. Yes, I mean, I, th I think the key thing is the size of the effect you're looking for. So if you're looking for a big effect on a rare outcome, um, survival for meningococcal uh, septicemia, uh, give penicillin, but you only need to do a few patients before it's just it's, it's uh, barned or obvious that this is a treatment that works. Actually, most of the time, what we're looking for is moderate effects. Um, people might be claiming and hoping for uh, larger than moderate effects. That's the sort of inventor's bias, if you like. But we're looking for moderate effects. And what we're trying to differentiate is the difference between there being some effect, but modest and valuable, uh, versus no effect at all. And to do that, one needs to overcome the bias, and that needs randomization, plus one needs the lar large numbers in order to overcome chance. And I think it's a, a failure to, uh, to start with the, uh, what's the size of, of effect I'm interested in as being the sort of starting point that has led people to uh, believe that they can just chase uh, large, uh, large numbers from large data sets and don't do randomization. It's too hard to do the right experiment, so let's do the wrong one. That doesn't make sense. Oh, Jeff. Yeah. Pragmatic means practical, so it makes about as much sense to call a trial pragmatic um, uh, as it does to call it real world. <laughs> um, but I think, and I think that there is confusion in the, ter in, in the terminology more seriously, is that where you get your data from and whether you randomize or not are two different issues. And in the, co in the context of randomization, then the ASCENGE trial is certainly pragmatic. And trials that are based entirely in registries, such as a TASTE trial in, in Sweden, uh, are you know, both registry-based and pragmatic, but they are randomized. And so actually the noise that comes out from having uh, imperfect data uh, actually, uh, if you like, washes out, uh, and it is simply noise, and uh, uh, you still get a robust evaluation of the treatment. So... Yes, exactly. You can get the data from mobile technology, routine healthcare, uh, ask the doctors, ask the patients, look in the hospital notes. It doesn't matter how you do it. The question is, do you randomise? Thank you. Um, I'm just reflecting on the vision. I was wondering, and I'll elaborate as quickly as I can, um, if there was a vision that encompassed the pair. And here I'm talking about... Um, the size of the trial and the fact that payers have to make decisions on very limited evidence. Now I can see regulators want to get new treatments to patients as quickly as possible and it's one thing to show that it has a significant clinical effect and if that effect is quite large, you need very small, you, you, you require quite small population. But when it comes to paying potentially a million pounds per treatment, you can't live with those sorts of uh, samples that are trial sizes, and um, it makes the decision really difficult. Now, the important thing is that the regulators, I think, like this, they want to get the, the drugs to patients as quickly as possible. If payers don't have enough um, certainty, there's too much uncertainty around whether or not it's cost effective at the prices that the companies want, then either, you know, or there are various possibilities. So it could be that it's approved when it shouldn't be approved for pay, by the payer, in which case it's a waste of resources, or there are effect drugs that w will not be approved when they should be approved uh, simply because of the uncertainty. So 
I mean, might the regulators at some point actually think about the payer perspective? Sorry for making that a bit too long. I'm not sure what, what the regulators will, will or should think. I'm not in a position to tell them <clears throat> or to comment. But what I would say is that in, in designing the trial, the aim of the trial, particularly the, this sort of trial, is to impact on patient care. And if uh, one uh, doesn't uh, provide sufficient information uh, to convince not only the regulators that they, yes, it, yes, it can be licensed, but those who are going to pay, that yes, they're going to pay for it in adequate, in, in adequate volumes, uh, then one hasn't produced enough evidence to convince, uh, uh, to convince uh, all those who need to be convinced. Um, so I think actually thinking about what the payer's perspective is, is really important. And in fact, I know that when we were designing a, uh, a round four, then uh, what size of effect would actually be use, would, would actually, and what were the considerations, NICE or others, would be looking for, and what size of effect does one have to uh, try and assess in order to pass what would be likely to be the sort of paying threshold. So thinking about the payer's perspective is really important. But I think you're, one thing I would say on the GCP guidelines piece, that the payer's perspective is also important in that. Um, uh, it, as I say, it needs to be a broad audience in the end. I, I think that's a really in, in good place to stop because it really does kind of, I think, raise the other issue of the NHS. That, um, you, up till now, what happens is a company goes along to the regulatory authority with its trial protocol and says this is going to get approval. Uh, I think with the NHS, not only do, as I said earlier, do we have the scale, the heterogeneity, the data, but we also have um, the NHS and NICE. Uh, and perhaps in the same way that um, one goes to the regulator at the beginning, one should be going to NICE and the NHS at the beginning, and that they should be part of the process of determining what is a successful uh, clinical trial in terms of not only something that is effective and safe, but also affordable, uh, and working from the very beginning. Uh, and Clyde Meanwell, who has been referred to earlier, talks about how with the air, uh, aeronautics in industry, um, Boeing or Airbus don't just build a whole load of planes, and then when they've completed the building of them, they say, we've got a warehouse in Nevada with 20 planes who want to buy one. They actually work with the industry to work out what it is the companies want before they start uh, designing and building the planes. And I think that, again, within the NHS, we have this extraordinary opportunity to kind of do all of that um, and generate evidence that can actually then be implemented uh, because we can afford to do it. And that, that impact will be not just on the UK, but global. And I think we have a potential within the UK to be a global leader in this area. So uh, on that point, I think we should end uh, and uh, uh, thank the two speakers.